Olá pessoal, bem-vindas e bem-vindos à edição especial da playlist Minha História Ambiental. Nós tivemos a felicidade de entrevistar o professor Donald Woster, um dos principais historiadores ambientais do mundo. Falamos sobre diversos assuntos a respeito da sua trajetória, a respeito das suas obras, do seu pensamento e, é claro, conseguimos né, fazer uma entrevista que ficou bastante longa e bastante rica. Então, optamos em dividi-la em duas partes. O que você vai ver em seguida é a primeira parte da entrevista. Então, continue nos acompanhando que em breve disponibilizaremos a segunda parte. Agora você fica, então, com a vinheta e com a entrevista. Olá, pessoal! Sou a Helenita Malta, professora de História na Universidade Federal de Rondonópolis, Mato Grosso. Olá, boa noite. Eu sou o Denis Henrique Fiuza, sou doutorando em História pela Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina, em Florianópolis. Olá, eu sou a Sara Rocha Fritz, mestrando em História na Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina. Sejam muito bem-vindas e bem-vindos à edição especial, especialíssima, da playlist Minha História Ambiental. Nessa playlist, quem nos acompanha já sabe, estamos entrevistando historiadoras e historiadores ambientais que se destacam no campo. Eles vão falar sobre a sua trajetória na história ambiental. O nosso objetivo é inspirar estudantes e pessoas em geral a se interessarem por história ambiental. Lutz Goblau é um canal que surgiu de projeto de pesquisa científico apoiado pelo CNPq e é também uma iniciativa de história ambiental pública. Para acompanhar essa playlist e os nossos vídeos, deixamos o convite para você se inscrever no canal. Assim você nos fortalece para continuarmos este trabalho de divulgação do conhecimento em história ambiental. E hoje estamos muito felizes, adiantes mesmo, com um convidado especialíssimo no nosso canal, o professor Donald Woster, um dos fundadores e um dos mais destacados historiadores do campo da história ambiental. Nós admiramos muito o seu trabalho, que tem sido fundamental para as pesquisas brasileiras na área. O professor Woster recebeu o título de Hall Distinguished Professor of American History da Universidade do Kansas. Em 2009, ele foi nomeado para a Academia Americana de Artes e Ciências. Após se aposentar na Universidade do Kansas, tornou-se especialista estrangeiro ilustre e professor sênior da Escola de História da Universidade Remin, da China. E esta é a primeira entrevista que o professor Dono Goster dá a alguém do Brasil. Isso é uma responsabilidade muito grande que esperamos corresponder. Vamos deixar na descrição do vídeo mais links sobre o professor Woster e obras que citarmos na entrevista. Bem-vindo, professor Donald Woster. É com muita honra e alegria que te recebemos no Lutz Global. Welcome, professor Donald Woster. It is with great honor and joy that we welcome you to Lutz Global. Oh, thank you very, very much. I send out my warm greetings all across your, your audience in Brazil, wherever this channel goes. I want to tell you how honored I am for this, by this invitation to show up. I have been retired from teaching for more than 10 years. So I am now a retiree uh, and I get fewer and fewer invitations to speak but I am honored by this one in particular, and I am so grateful that you are willing to do it in my own English language. I have tried to learn many different languages, but I have discovered I am not good at this. I am not good. I spend, I have spent as much as a full four years in China, and I cannot speak Chinese. What should I speak? I can hardly speak English. So, I am very grateful for your willingness and your tolerance of my limited language skills, but it is great to be here. And I must tell you all, I've been to Brazil several times and each time I like the country better and better. It's a magnificent place. 
And I'm glad to see so much interest in, in environmental history in Brazil these days. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you, Professor. We are very glad, very honored by uh, have you here in our channel. <laughs> yes, yeah, good. Well, let's start the okay. questions. First, about your trajectory. Professor, could you tell us more about your biographical data? Where were you born? What was the landscape you lived with as a child like? Do you remember any special episode of your relationship with the local nature? And in the 60s, why did you choose to study history? <laughs> well, I should start by saying what is probably clear to all of your audience. I'm an old man. I am 81 years old. Uh, as of last year. I was born, therefore, before the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. That's a long, long time ago. Uh, I was born in a small desert town, Mojave Desert Town in Southern California on the banks of the Colorado River, the famous Colorado River where the Grand Canyon lies and Las Vegas is just upstream. But my father was there and my parents were there as refugees, environmental refugees from the Great Plains of North America, which in the late 1930s, all the way up to almost the time of my birth, was one of the world's most severe environmental catastrophes, mainly wind erosion, dust storms, agricultural collapse and economic collapse. They were of working class origins, of rural farming background, my parents, from the state of Kansas, which sits squarely in the center of the lower 48 states. It's dead center of America. Uh, some people say it's really dead center. <laughs> it's quite boring, they think, but I love this place. I love it a lot. Um, so I grew up in this little desert town, but, but moved back with my mother and later my father to the Great Plains where we lived with my grandparents for many years. They too were from a poor rural background, small farmers, before that immigrants from the British Isles, Scotland, Wales, uh, England. When I grew up in Kansas, it was already the late 1940s and the 1950s. For most people, this was a time of getting back to what they thought was normal, normal life, normal economics, normal prosperity, normal religion, whatever. It was There was a return of rainfall, an end to what had been the most severe drought in hundreds of years. President of the United States was one of our native sons from Kansas, Dwight David Eisenhower the military man who was a Kansan. Those, for many people, were the happy years, the 1950s especially. I was in school, graduating from high school at the end of that decade. But for me, they were not so happy. They were plagued by many things. My family never had much money. That was one thing. But they were especially plagued by the development for me of severe asthma, breathing problems. I found out I was allergic to nature. Nature makes me sick. It made me really sick in those years. I'm talking about uh, dust in general. There was a lot of dust blowing always. I'm talking about some of the plants like ragweed, which devastated me. But I'm especially talking about the dust that came from harvesting and milling wheat. Wheat is the great crop of Kansas. And I found out I was allergic to it. It put me in the hospital again and again when I was a small boy. So for me, nature was both a place to go to escape the family, social pressures, to get away and be myself, to read. It was a place of delight 
I love that great plains with a huge sky and so forth, the rivers coming through. It's basically a grassland, native grassland. But I also know, I learned that nature can kill us. And it often does. And I never forget this fact. I'm an environmental historian. I love nature. I want to bring nature and all the things of nature into the study of history. But I have to say from the beginning that nature is not our friend always. Nature is a devastating uh, force in our lives, can be. So that's that's a bit of the sketch. By the night I went through in the 1950s, particularly around 1954, a new dust storm, the beginnings of new dust storms. I was a schoolboy, and about in the middle of the morning, the teacher stopped the class, and the whole school shut down. We were all told to go home because an immense dust storm, a mile high of dust blowing, rolling, was coming to our town. So we all ran home as fast as we could, and we and all through the night the dust kept blowing. It got inside our house, even inside our ice box or refrigerator. There was dust on our pillows. I was choking and coughing from this event. So I had been through dust storms. I know what severe soil erosion is like, and I don't like it, and I don't want to see it ever again. But it is still happening in some ways. By the 1960s, I was in college, and I went to the University of Kansas, and, and from there went on to do graduate study in history at Yale University, which is in New England, a famous old Ivy League school, which had a great history faculty by conventional terms. Um, when I got to Yale in 1966, I was there from 66 to 1971. There was almost no interest in environmental matters, none. I wasn't even sure I was interested in it myself. Um, but I was struck by things there that just seemed to me to be really weird. Forest seemed to me still to be rather weird things to see. There were no forests where I grew up. There were nothing but forests in New England when I grew up. Water. There was very little water going through my country in the desert or in the Great Plains. But when I got to New England, to New Haven, Connecticut, to Boston, to New York, water was everywhere, especially in the spring. It was just flowing through the land. Everything was flooded. Everything was mud. This seemed to me to be extremely weird. I thought, why would anybody live in such a place? Well, it of course, had been the home of settled imperial civilizations for hundreds of years, great colonial towns and the rest. But to me, it was a shock, and it helped me begin thinking about the role the environment plays in who we are and in the kind of economies and living and food we eat. That was, that was the beginnings of my education, but it didn't come in classrooms, not at all, not at all. Um, the 1970s, I mean the 1960s, let me excuse me, the 1960s saw the beginnings of a strong environmental protection movement in the United States, influenced by people like Rachel Carson, Aldo Leopold, Paul Ehrlich, very commoner in, in North America, and I'm talking about. Uh, it was a, almost a radical moment in American history for environmental protection. I was not much involved in it, but I was reading people like Henry David Thoreau, uh, the 19th century nature writer. Um, and I shared the views that many of these people had in the 19, by the 1960s, that this technological civilization that we have built or were building then and still are building was itself a danger. It was... It, it too can kill us through atomic radiation, through pesticides. Uh, it too can dehumanize us. And it too, uh, or it, it alone was destroying ecological health on the planet for all living things. So that came as a kind of shock to me. 
as a farm kid from the Great West, but I understood what it was because I think the Dust Bowl itself was one product of a technological civilization. So I will stop there. I've probably spent more than five minutes on that answer, but um, if you have questions about it, we can go further and talk more. But that's a that's my that's my bio. That, that's my study in my history. That your listeners, I am on the west coast of North America now, in the state of Oregon. I'm about a, an hour's drive from the Pacific Ocean. And most of the time here in the winter, it rains and rains and rains and rains. This is even weirder than New Haven, Connecticut. This is a really weird place, but it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Great trees and forests. And so when we have sun, we want to have it inside the house. We don't want to keep it out. We're hungry for sunshine. It's because of our right. interview. <laughs> So it's very interesting, your biography <laughs> really, really nice. Um, the farm seems really scary. <laughs> so um, uh -huh. uh, I want to say hello to everyone who's watching our interview. Hello to Professor Wolster. Uh, my first question is about uh, what you have uh, talked a little bit already. Uh, your first approach to environmental issues, right? Uh, how was it? Uh, you are a graduated student when Silent Spring was published, right? Uh, mm -hmm. How was the background back then? In the 70s, uh, the debate intensified. Uh, did you participate in environmental move, move, movements at the time or later? Okay. Yes, I have touched on this to some extent. The critical years for me were my graduate years in a PhD program in history. I went to Yale to study American history. That's what we did in those days. I didn't think anything about anything else. I thought I might also do some British history, which I did. I was very interested in Anglo-American connections. But I, and as I said, I found myself living in a radically different physical, material, and ecological environment. Um, this abundance of, of some things that I was not used to. But there was a problem with history as I began to encounter it at Yale. At that time, Yale was probably considered in many places the best history department in the world. I'm not exaggerating. I think it was just full of outstanding faculty members. And they were not uncritical people. They were highly critical of many things. Uh, but there was a problem with the history that they were teaching as and as I experienced it, there was no land in it. There was no water in it. There was no drought, no climate. There, was no, there were no plants or animals. There was no pollen. There was no disease. Um, it was all intellectual history and cultural history up here. I took classes with the great C. Van Woodward, probably the the greatest historian of the American South in the whole 20th century. Uh, he was writing books about the idea of the New South, about Jim Crow laws, racial segregation and injustice. But he was writing from the point of view of ideas, mostly. I was taking classes with people like Edmund Morgan, one of the great colonial Americanists from Boston, who taught colonial American history, New England, Puritanism, ideas of religion, the power of religion and commerce. His last great book was, was on Ben Franklin, but before that he wrote a book called American Slavery, American Freedom. Again, it was about the cultural history of these ideas, slavery and freedom in the same society, community. Important topics. I mean, these guys were going through themselves upheaval. They were reflecting the Vietnam War. They were reflecting in their work, uh, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the war on poverty. And so were most of my fellow graduate students. But um, most of the rebellious students around me at that time and the faculty had no knowledge of or interest in 
the non-human world. None. They all came from big cities. They had no idea what I was talking about. They used to laugh at me and say, are you interested in writing about history of bears? They thought it was just incredible that anybody could be. And I said, you damn right. That's right. Bears deserve some history too. Uh, there was at that time very little environmental interest at Yale. There was a forestry school, which has since become an environmental studies and forestry school. And I've been back there. I spent a year there. But in 1970, the year of the first Earth Day, there was very little environmental interest at Yale. In fact, I can't even remember any kind of thing going on on the first Earth Day, 1970, on my campus. Maybe I just was not paying attention, but there were no environmental movements there before the 1970s that I could see. And even at the late, I left in 1971. Um, and if it happened, it happened after I left. So I was trying to create a new kind of history that was not there in my classroom, that was not there for my teachers and my fellow students. What I discovered at Yale was incredibly powerful and important to me, and what I got in the way of an education was important. But I will have to say also, I discovered the poverty of the left, of the right, of the center in American politics, in America and elsewhere. The poverty of our imagination, the poverty of our knowledge. There was, there were old, there was an old guard and there were new radicals, but they were both completely indifferent and ignorant about the non-human world. Uh, it had no historical agency, none. Uh, it had no moral concern. Uh, it was completely lacking as a context for human life. It was just not even there as human life. So it was very dissatisfying to me, as, as well as being very stimulating and so on. So that's not to be hostile or ungrateful to my teachers and so forth, but it just started me as a graduate student thinking that there should be more in history. From what I knew growing up, there were deserts and they mattered. There were dust storms and they mattered. There were plants and animals on this planet and they matter. There were rivers and they matter a lot. These people took it all for granted. It was just, I'd become unseen, invisible to them. So that's that's where I, where I left graduate school, determined to try to figure out something new. And my Graduate student colleagues laughed a little bit about it, but later many of them came around to say, Don, I think you were onto something here. You know, I'm sorry, but we were a little so rude to you. One of them actually went on to write a good biography of Rachel Carson. So it does happen, to, but they weren't there yet. You could go down to the Natural History Museum, one of the best on a college campus anywhere in the United States right there in New Haven on the Yale campus and see these dinosaurs and bones and plant remains and so on. That was history to me. That was history too. But the history department did not acknowledge it. And to a large extent, they still do not. That's the sad thing I have to end with. They still do not. We're still fighting. We're winning all over the place but some of those older places are so set in their way, so traditional. Even if they're writing about slavery from the point of view of slaves, they are traditional in some respects. You could, they can write an entire book about cotton, for example, as one scholar has done. He's now at Harvard teaching there. A great, huge book on cotton, the biggest book we've ever seen on cotton. It goes all over the planet, but there's very, very little of the cotton plant and soils and those sorts of things or bull weevils in that book. He just is completely tone deaf about such subjects. We won't let that happen in the future. <laughs> okay. Well, it's interesting that you participate on the first Earth Day. <laughs> Seven. Well, I was there, but there was no Earth Day in New Haven, Connecticut. There was a big one in New York, 
but I that would mean get on the train and drive and riding for almost two hours down to New York to see that I didn't do that. It was my fault, maybe. <laughs> I got on the, I got on the train to go down to Washington D.C. to protest Richard Nixon and his policies in Vietnam. I I joined the anti-war protest, but I never thought that that was so important to me as learning about the earth and the world that I came from. So uh, partly this was because it, this was due to the fact that nobody at Yale in those days really talked very much about the Western part of the United States. It was unheard of. Maybe this happens in Brazil too. If you're out in Mato Grosso, you, you, they, don't, they don't know where you are. What is that country? It's a tropical savanna, right? Yes, savanna. But, they, but how many people in Rio know anything or care anything about, I don't know. But in, certainly in the United States, if you were from the Western part of the country, you were a foreigner. And you were expected to learn what New Englanders thought and believed and looked at, not think for yourself. They let me think for myself. I can say that for very, very happily. Yes. Dennis? <clears throat> very interesting. Uh, dear Horst, Horster, uh, I hope you are um, go uh, doing fine. <clears throat> I I feel yeah, okay. honored to be talking to you, and um, yeah. thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Uh, but my first question is: You are considered one of the founders of environmental history, uh, so could you talk more about your involvement in the beginnings of the uh, historiographical field? And how was the founding of American Society for Environment History? And which of which others influenced you in the construction of this field of study? Okay. Well, these are all big, juicy questions that I could go on for hours about. As I said, there was no environment history when I was a graduate student at Yale in the 1970s. Nothing. I taught, the, I think, maybe one of the very first environmental history courses ever in the world in my last year at Yale, 1970 to 71. I had a group of undergraduate students, and we launched a class on environmental history. My first assignment to them was, let's take out Saturday, and let's go find the harbor, the New Haven Harbor on Long Island Sound. It was once a port city. But since it had all been filled in with oil tanks and energy supplies and all that, and we had to go, we went, 12 students and I, on a hot, sweaty day, walking across the city, trying to discover how the, where the harbor was. We'd lost it. We found it. We did find it. We found a lot of fences, too. And that got me started. But... I had to leave Yale and I had to move to other campuses before we could really begin to see what we could do. And it wasn't just me alone. There were some people on other campuses, not so much on the East Coast as in the Midwest. I remember a meeting in 1975, around then, in San Antonio, Texas. It's a beautiful old city, a great old Hispanic city. And there was a guy there named John Opie who taught at a small college in Western Pennsylvania. There was a woman there called named Susan Flatter, who still is alive and taught at the University of Missouri from Wisconsin originally, Leopold country. We all three met and talked about founding a new society for environmental history. That was 1975. Two years later, the American Society was founded in Washington, D.C. Uh, and since it has grown to be, have several thousand members, and there's now a European, there's a Lat Latin American, there is an East Asian, there is, there are probably others, environmental history societies in the world. In fact, there are tens of thousands of people now doing environmental history. So we young folk, graduate students and new professors, 
at least in the United States in those years, managed to start something going. We had to fight, but we did get something going. Um, and since it's grown, a, a phenomenal. I would never have expected. I attended a meeting last month at Harvard University, a meeting on Chinese environmental history. God save us, Chinese environmental history. It was attended by people from China, but, but mostly they were from the United States. There were 50 or 60 people there just to talk about China's environmental history. And there were some very smart, smart people there, including James Scott and uh, Peter Perdue uh, and so forth and so on. So very influential and very impressive. Who influenced me in all of this? I was influenced, of course, by my parents and their experiences. I was influenced by my community and where I lived. Um, I, I was ex influenced during the 60s and 70s by people I read outside the classroom, not in the classroom. I've mentioned some of them, Carson and so forth, Ehrlich, Commoner. Not, not many historians, and certainly not what many people assume had to be the beginning of environmental history, the Annal School in France. And I hear this all the time from people. The Annal School were there doing all this before you. You must have picked it up from them. No, I had no idea who the people were. I hadn't even heard of Brodel, let alone his boss or his mentor, Lefebvre, a geographical historian, historical geography. I didn't know those people's names. I, had, I couldn't read French. I didn't know what was going on then. So it, this whole thing came from graduate students and uh, young professors who felt the call, the mission, and the freedom to start something new. So I always say to graduate students, just go out there and do what you think is important to do. And if you are, keep at it, you'll find a lot of people behind you and with you. And you may, in fact, even change the way we do history. There were, of course, some historians, although they're more literary scholars than they were really environmental people, like Henry Nash Smith, uh, Leo Marx, Roderick Nash, and others. Uh, writers like Wallace Stegner in the West, um, whom I did read, Ed Abbey, but I wouldn't consider those any, they were, I didn't encounter them on any syllabuses in my classes. And I've done, I didn't find their work very satisfactory because they were mostly interested in cultural images. They were interested in people first and foremost who had ideas about nature. People who had ideas about nature was what they really, and they were fascinated by intellectual history again. Well, I started off this way, but I changed. I thought there was something here basically that was real and material and, and had a profound influence on who we are. I could look back also though to professors I had as undergraduates uh, at the University of Kansas, James Malin, an historian who's almost forgotten today, M-A-L-I-N is his name. He grew up in Western Kansas in the Dust Bowl years. He was the first person I ever saw who actually began to read and study ecology as a way of understanding history. His views were familiar, would be familiar to Donald Trump today. I mean, his political views, he was a super conservative, but nonetheless, there was this guy strangely all by himself out there in Lawrence, Kansas doing that, putting ecology and history together. And before him, and probably the most important intellectual influence I've had is as a historian, was Walter Prescott Webb at the University of Texas in Austin, who in the 1930s wrote a book on the Great Plains and other books about environment. Um, but my point is that I realized that I had to learn ecology and I had no background in the sciences, none. So the only way I could do this was to write a history of ecology and to do it as Yaleys were supposed to do, as kind of a cultural and intellectual history. That's what I did. It became my first book. My professors all told me, this is crazy. What kind of book is this? You start in the 18th century and you come to the present. You, you have all this stuff on Darwin, Thoreau, 
what's who are these people? Well, anyway, the book is still in print. It's been translated into five or six languages. So I think it's done pretty well for a PhD dissertation, but it was my way of learning what ecology is all about. That's what I what set out to do. So all of my books after that were set in the American West <clears throat> and they were all about science and ecology and um, its value to historians. I love nature's economy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, every professor I had, including the guy who directed it, thought it was not a good title or subject to write about. <laughs> but I did it for my own purposes. I didn't do it to get a job. And, um, but it helped me clarify through a more traditional approach is to science um, what I needed to know let's talk about your publications. You wrote the biography of two important figures in USA conservation history, John Muir and the naturalist John Wesley Powell. Your work is very important in reference for me as I have been working with the biography of individuals who are protectors of nature in Brazil. Henrique Hessler in my master uh, José Luxemburg, and current a woman, Palmira Gobi, an animals protector. How can biography contribute to environmental history? How can biography help us understand micro and macro issues better than other areas of history? <clears throat> well, I first should say that my my early reaction was that biography is not history and I shouldn't do it. My professors didn't think I should be writing biographies. That wouldn't have been acceptable. Ideal. History was supposed to be a broad social economic forces rather than individuals. That was the old model. And I grew up not respecting the old model, which was so celebra celebration of some famous person's life and model. What he said was so inspirational, blah, blah, blah. We had to know his life. I, I didn't, I was not interested in doing that. Uh, and I actually in public once or twice said, history and biography are not the same. But I have to say I was wrong. I learned I was wrong. I did a book after Nature's Economy on the Dust Bowl experience. I did another book going farther west on water, dam building, irrigation, agriculture in the generally in the American West, uh, which you could say was a product of my growing up on the banks of the Colorado River, which has been dammed so many times. But after having done that and written several books of shorter pieces, essays, I began to ask myself, was I actually falling into a trap? The trap in history is that when you start thinking about big thoughts and big ideas, you come up with very big abstract causes. And the world becomes actually much more simple. There's the black and there's the white. There's there's Capitalism, there's communism, there's left and right. You, we begin to think in these broad, abstract terms that are usually bipolar or, or, or disjunctive in this way. And I realized that I was actually in danger of that. Other people pointed it out to me, but I accepted it. Uh, and so I needed a corrective influence. And I thought, instead of writing more books about broad movements, progressivism, environmentalism, all the isms. Why don't I write about people, specific people, who had an important role to play? Yes. Who may have inspired people? Yes. But who were mostly very complicated individuals. And I would find that my big generalizations needed qualification. They were too broad. They were too general. This is what everybody tells you about biography. Once you get into trying to understand 
one particular person, you will discover you never understand him. You can never do it. It's easier to understand the world if you talk about capitalism. You already have a book to tell you how to think. But if you just look at the person's life, who, like Karl Marx, you might find out he's a lot more complicated and there's a lot in him that doesn't fit the model. So that's what I started to do. I took two great leaders of the environmental movement in the United States in the late 19th century. The first was John Wesley Powell, and the second was John Muir, two Johns. The very, very similar backgrounds in the Midwest in Protestant evangelical families. I called my, my project Two Johns in the American West, <laughs> which is a little bit cheeky, I know. Um, but um, what astonished me was that these two guys growing up with the same kind of families, almost within a few miles of each other at points, became environmentalists, but of a very different sort of from each other. Each of them was quite different from the other. I hadn't expected that, really. And, uh, and it was obviously the product of so much of their personal experience. I think historians need to work at many different scales so that they don't become just ideologues for this side or that side, this ism or that ism, so that they begin to understand that people and history, like the natural world, is far more complex than we can ever understand, than we'll ever be able to unpack. Um, people are more complicated than movements. People are more complicated than all of our generalizations. So we ought to now and then study any an individual's life. And we'll soon enter a world that is far more complicated than we ever imagined. We need all kinds of scales in the study of environmental history. We haven't thought about this enough. <clears throat> Ecologists think about it all the time. They think about all the scales. There's the individual plant, let's say, in a desert or a tropical savanna. That's one scale. Or you can study the plant community or the plant as part of an ecosystem of organic and inorganic organic elements, or you can study at the level of a biome, which covers much of a continent, like the Amazon rainforest, or you can go to other scales, the planet, the planet Earth is a scale that we need to look at now and then. We need to be able to think about all these scales and how they integrate. Uh, this is a fundamental need for environmental historians to do, because the scale for us is not given. For most historians, the scale is quite clear what, clear what it is. It's the nation state. It's Brazil. It's Uruguay. It's America, United States of America. It's China. But for, for environmental historians, we have abandoned the nation state as our frame of reference. We don't take that as necessary. It has some influence, but it's not the scale that we just grow up with accepting and, and use all the time. So we need to think more self-consciously about this. I think the scientists do much better at this than historians. Your interpretation of the three levels of environmental history is very important in Brazilian studies. <clears throat> very huge. Uh, do you think that today it is still valid to think about these three levels? Has anything changed? <laughs> oh, well, people told me that I should put more than three in the, in the picture. I'll tell you how this all came about. Somebody asked me to, to write a general introduction to environmental history, and I thought, well, I can break it down into at least three categories. So I had, on the one hand, the natural world itself, which is a dynamic presence and has its own history. We call it evolution, but it's still history. And we have on the other side, all these ideas and culture, laws, policies, values, religion. What's in between these two? It was that middle ground that I wanted to try to emphasize more and more. I thought that historians should look at. I call it modes of production, but you could call it modes of consumption, ways of life, economies, 
that sort of thing. But it would look at technology, how people make a living, what they eat, where they get that food. It would basically put our bellies in the center, our bellies, you know, uh, our food. This should be, environmental studies should be about bellies and hunger. Since then, I've added sex. I think sex is so fundamental to environmental history, I cannot imagine how I ever left it out. You know, but, but the desires that humans have that are not, that we are often born with, that we do not learn growing up, going to church, doing this, going to school, uh, et cetera. I took this model from a great anthropologist, in my view, a great anthropologist, Marvin Harris, Columbia University, who wrote a big book on cultural materialism. Basically, he said cultures don't just come out of nowhere. They don't control everything. They are rooted in something more material. And I said, you're right. But the material is not just Karl Marx's material, working class versus capital. It is also the earth, plants, animals, and all these things. So, so that's how I came up with these three categories. I had, I had basically Karl Marx's modes of production and all the superstructure of ideas, and I just stuck on nature because I thought it had been left out, and and I and I used Marvin Harris for that. So, of course, there are people who disagree with this altogether. They say this is reductive. Well, it can be. Or they say, what is the relationship between these? And I say, I don't know. I just know that they're all three there and they're all important. And there are these little arrows going back and forth and so on. Work it out. I happen to think that the middle one, ways of life, ways we produce and consume things, these desires that we're born with, which make us part of nature, is the most important we ought to be dealing with. But that's just my view. So, you know, we, traditional historians like the only, only the last one, the cultural side. What are the, what laws did we pass? What movements did we establish? What books did we write? What poets do we read? What landscape architects and painters do we have? But I think that's kind of riding along the top. But, you know, I can't, I cannot overcome this controversial question. How are these related? That's really essential. What do we emphasize, et cetera? So, and in fact, I think many of my environmental historian colleagues have forgotten these, these questions. I go to the meeting like the last one in Boston, and all I hear in every session is the, the word justice, justice. And I hear people saying, basically, this should be our unifying theme. We're all interested in environmental justice. And I say to them, no, we're not all interested in justice. You have your idea of justice. I have an idea of justice. Everyone in the room's got a different idea of justice. And we can go on talking about it and so on. But do not assume that there is just one thing called environmental justice, and you know what it is, and everybody else should agree. That's not the way environmental history works. It's much more open-ended than this. I'm not saying throw it out. I'm just saying, when we use this word, don't assume that everybody knows what it is. It is part of all these other things going on, and we should be much more cautious in our in our um, generalizing about what environmental history is about. That's, but that grows out of my my feeling that we're not following a more co a complicated enough model. We have a very simplistic model often in environmental history today. Find out what what is unjust, where there's an injustice in the world linked to the, the natural world, and there you've got a book. Everybody knows what, it, what it's about, what the conclusion is going to be. We've already done that enough. Let's go on, it seems to me. I'm going off the rails, perhaps, on your questions, but uh, this is what I am thinking. Wonderful. In your book about those ball, you discuss the change in, in land use and mm -hmm. at the local and regional levels, highlighting human-induced 
uh, consistent transformation uh, through destructive trends in North America agricultural practices. Could you tell us about this interaction between agricultural production methods and environment in research path in environment history? And do you think that experience of this bow calls any learning for American society? Excuse me. Uh, this interview is I'm starting to make me cough, but it's my own problem. Well, let me say first again that I think agriculture belongs at the center of environmental history. <clears throat> the old agricultural history was mostly about progress in production, how much we produce, how much we can get, how many people we can support. But I think those problems are much more complicated than we've realized before, and environmental history can show that. Agriculture is the one, probably the most important um, way in which we change or affect the planet. It's not industry, it's not plastics manufacturing, it's the farm, it's agriculture, our use of the land. And it's been this way for 10,000 years. When we made the shift from a foraging life into an agricultural life, we were making a profound revolution that changed our relationship to the earth, with each other, everything follows from that. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I grew up in a farming family, and I, but I am, I think, free of the kind of uh, uh, mythology of agriculture. It often glorifies it as somehow it comes some kind of beautiful relationship between people and nature. Agriculture has had it in its hand a whip ever since it was first established. You go back and look at all those old pictures and read the old poems. They've got an ox and they're driving the ox with a whip. And pretty soon they've got a slave driving the ox and the slave is being whipped. So agriculture has a lot to explain, a lot to try to explain why it is what it is going back for 10,000 years. Some have called it a, a mistake. I'm not, I don't think it was a mistake. I think it was the only thing we could have done because we had babies to feed. We had too many babies to feed and foraging life was unsustainable. So I'm not saying that it was a mistake, but I am saying that it has brought consequences that just continue to unfold. By the time you get to the 1920s and 30s in North America, agriculture itself has evolved into something quite different. It's a private property system, it's a system designed for world production. The population of the planet is now, in 1927, when the Great Plains were being plowed up, the population of the world turned over to 2 billion. It had been, it reached 1 billion around 1804. That's the first milestone. Within less, well, within just a little over a, a century, it reached 2 billion. It reached 3 billion in another 30 or 40 years, and 4 billion. And now it stands at 8 billion. <clears throat> and to feed all of those people, even the most minimal way, requires agriculture. And so you have to look at demography in this whole picture. And environmental historians, have not been paying nearly enough attention to demography. They all, we have, the answer is always, well, some people eat more than others. Well, yes, but that um, most people cannot eat two or three times what other people eat. I have no doubt that my argument in general is right still, that the Dust Bowl was a man-made environmental catastrophe, a disaster that something like, well, not only my parents, but hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people left the Great Plains states during the 1930s, most of them because of the Great Depression and uh, the agricultural crisis 
that was all around him. So it is a man-made disaster, and we have seen more and more such disasters. And disaster research has become a key part of environmental history. Good. I wrote that book in 12 months. I did all the research and wrote the book itself in 12 months. <clears throat> it was, it's a very short book. If I had taken more time, if I had been able to take more time, I would have put in a lot more about the context in which those farmers operated. We know they had very little knowledge about ecology, grasslands, and the role that grasses played in stabilizing this very marginal environment. They didn't have much knowledge. They were newcomers for the most part. That much I made clear. But we didn't pay we I didn't pay enough attention <clears throat> to the ways in which they were basically caught up in what is already a global economy. The market for the wheat they were raising was not only for the for the United States, which then had a population of over 100 million people. Uh, they didn't come out there until there was, in fact, a, pop, a, a huge population that was demanding food in the form of bread, in the form of meat. So they were there because of the rest of the country. And it wasn't simply because of people on Wall Street, although those people had a role in it. All kinds of people had a role in making this agriculture what it was. It's if you want to talk about it as a man-made disaster, where were the men and women behind it? Well, they were not only in the United States, but they were in many other countries of the world because that wheat was often going overseas to some other place. You could say the same thing about soybeans in Brazil today. They're going to China to feed pigs to help improve the meat diet of the Chinese. And I can tell you from having spent so much time in China, the Chinese love it. They love the meat. They love the soybeans. They love their pigs. They love beef. And so, and there are 1.4 billion Chinese. Brazil would not even have a, have a place in their world if there were only 500 million Chinese. They wouldn't need Brazil. So again and again, we come back to this incredible importance of reproduction, human numbers, the pressure they bring upon lands all over the planet as part of the context. And in that context, government, business, capital, farm machinery, people, technologists, engineers, chemists, all play a role. And they're not bad people. They're not bad people. They're not the meanies of the world that we want to put into jail. I think this is what I any good historian would have to say about them. They're working in their context. They're working with a population that is growing by tens of millions every year. And they're exporting all over the world. They're not doing it out of some kind of benevolence. They're doing it for money. <clears throat> but they don't make the demand. We make the demand, all of us, um, and so on. So what have we learned? Well, if we're going to reform our agricultural system and make it more uh, <clears throat> compatible to the ecology, first, you have to have ecology. You have to have knowledge. You gotta know what a grass looks like and what its root structures are like and how the roots of native plants evolve deep and thick. And they held these the soil in ways that wheat, an imported crop, never could do. You have to have that knowledge. And you have to have also the populations, the support networks, the global trade networks, all of that goes into making a man-made environmental disaster on the Great Plains. What have we learned? Well, we still basically assume, and I think for good reason, that the only way we get out of one mess is to invent another. <laughs> that is, invent new technologies. Right now, when it comes to global warming, we all blame the fossil fuels. But the fossil fuels are only a part of the picture. Uh, <clears throat> and when you start looking at other possibilities, you find 
you're going to be making you're going to be planting wind machines solar panels all over places like the american west in order to generate enough, enough electricity so sometimes we have to go back to the root causes and say maybe we need fewer people on the planet maybe we need to encourage these sorts of policy changes there maybe we need to address this issue but it's not being addressed in environmental history today and it's not as far as i can see being addressed in political circles today it has become a highly forbidden topic uh you if you start talking about it you they think oh here comes thomas malthus again you know that's not what i'm talking about really he didn't invent this problem he only observed it from a narrow point of view at one point in history so what have we learned? <clears throat> well, we've got new techniques and a lot more new ones are coming on the market. I, I lived and worked for many years with an institute in Kansas, the Land Institute. I was the chairman of the board of directors for a decade. I'm a close friend of the president of that organization. The whole idea is to create a new agriculture that is based on ecology which will mean new kinds of technology, but basically new attitudes and ways of thinking about, about the ecosystems of this planet. How can we farm in ways that protect the environment? This is, to a very large extent, not a moral problem, but a technological problem. Uh, it's not about getting our heads right with Jesus. It's about figuring out how, what kind of knowledge we need and how to do it. And it requires the, 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 uh, strong efforts and imaginative efforts of scientists, engineers, technicians, uh, agronomists, a whole network of people. And it requires people who are willing to implement these, to learn and implement all of this. So uh, I think we are on the edge of some radically interesting new ideas in North America, at least as far as farming the Great Plains and providing wheat and meat. We're at a crisis, and, and most people know it. And I think we're at the edge, the, the beginnings of a possible breakthrough, but it will come from the frontier of scientists, not from <clears throat> this ideology or that ideology. That's my view in retrospect. I probably didn't say that strongly enough in the book. Many people felt offended by the book, thinking I was pointing a mean finger at them and accusing them of bad deeds. But um, I did see then, and I still see even more clearly today, uh, that when we make a disaster, and there are so many of them, we can't just go looking for one or two groups of people or this class of people or that group and blame, put the blame on them. It is a much more diffuse problem that confronts all of humanity and our numbers today. Professor. Nature's Economy, a history of ecological ideas. I'm glad I put the word ideas on there because my professors would all were all happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> So one of your books that I really like is the first one, Nature's Economy, in which yeah. you trace a trajectory of environmental thought since the 8th century, in particular parts 5 and 6, which speak of the context of the 20th century, in which José Luxemburger acted, and of Gaia theory by Lovelock and Margulis, by which he was greatly influenced. How do you assess the importance of Gaia theory today? <clears throat> How important is nature's economy to environmental history in the 21st century? Well, that's a, uh, that's a big question for me too. Um, I've already said that why I wrote that book, it was to teach myself, uh, about ecology by not just going into a modern ecology seminar, but studying the history of this field. And it was a way I could access it. So I think it still is useful for a lot of historians who are not familiar with the natural sciences, 
but realize we need their help in rewriting, remaking history uh, to read something like this. Um, but as far as the Gaia hypothesis, I met James Lovelock when he was much younger. He came to my university to speak and he was an incredibly eloquent man, a very stubborn man, a very uh, individualistic man who was going to stand and speak what he felt no matter what. And he had something <clears throat> really important to say. His message at that time, this was in, oh, the mid 90s, 1990s, early 1990s, was the message he started off with, that, that life at the surface of the earth, plants and, and their distribution so on, um, regulate the atmosphere above us, the gases in the atmosphere. There's a regulatory mechanism there. <clears throat> and it's become the basis of new earth sciences and new earth system sciences. But he said something at that point that got a lot of people upset. He said, Mother Nature is a tough old lady. She can take anything we throw at her. She will regulate all of this. Don't worry about greenhouse gases. Don't worry about them. Nature will regulate its way out of this. Nature has its own mechanisms for health. And he had an interesting point to make. And I think we should always consider that as a possibility. But a few decades later, as he continued to write books about Gaia, his Gaia hypothesis, <clears throat> he changed his message. He became much more worried about climate change and uh, even thought that we were on the edge of doom. Doom was heading down the road to us because of what we were doing in climate change. And he would put in nuclear power everywhere if he could in order to stop this from happening. So at that point, I began to think, Lovelock's Gaia can do this on the left hand or do this on the right hand. She's a wonderful person, but what, is the, what does Lovelock himself feel about any of this? What, is the, what are the limits of the Gaia hypothesis? Uh, <clears throat> where does it work and where does it not work? I think it has been very important for us getting a picture of a grasp of how this planet works. We're on the edge of understanding how the planet works. That is so much better than it was when I was a kid. The science is just amazing out there that we know, even though we don't know most of what we want to know, we still lack, but we, we do know a lot. And Lovelock's model was very important. How to understand the interaction of plants in the atmosphere, the gaseous atmosphere. Uh, and so we need a lot more of that kind of science and we need to bring it into the study of history. This is no, there's no doubt about my mind this, that we need to bring it into the study of history and to use it as we look back in time. But the other meaning of Gaia was something that is, I think, of more limited value, maybe even counter value. He got this idea, of course, from his friend, the novelist, uh, a novelist, uh, the writer of the Lord of the Flies book and other books. Uh, he suggested to Lovelock that, <clears throat> that he needed a name for this phenomenon of plant and, and atmospheric exchange, which is basically chemistry. And he said, there's this word Gaia that basically comes from the Greek goddess of nature. It's a religious kind of image. And Lovelock said, well, I don't want a religious thing. He said, yeah, but you don't have to have that. Just use that. In fact, of course, it was embraced by people with religious spiritual views all over the planet. And they began to say, nature knows best. Nature can save itself. Nature will always give us a benign and happy world. And... Uh, <clears throat> Lovelock began to discover, I think, that his tough old lady could die. And so I don't know where we are with this guy. Most scientists don't like the word very much because they think it suggests something supernatural. 
something almost spiritual in our relationship with the earth. And they prefer us to think more about <clears throat> chemistry, the impact of these plants and those plants on each other and upon the atmosphere. Uh, but even if you look at it in that way, is the earth so simply self-regulating, so predictably self-regulating that there's nothing we can do to harm it? What does it mean to damage this planet? Uh, these questions still remain very big and very unanswered. And I have to say, I have, I have to look to the scientists for answers on this because I don't think I can really trust the Archbishop of Canterbury or other religious leaders to give me answers to these questions. That's my own take on it. I'm, I'm pro-science, but I also am impatient to get some answers to these questions from the scientific community. Thank you, Professor.